if you think 2020, going back to, you know, you know all the different other, you know, 2010 and, and 2000, all these different things, each decade, when you look at it, you know, a, cult, a complete culture can be shaped and changed by a decade within those 10 years. You think about your life, a lot of different things have happened over the last 10 years, I'm sure. When we go back and, and I think when we look at here we are moving forward, and I know that this is something I mentioned the other day that, you know, God was just really kind of stirring in my heart from my life, and that was to really look at it in the question I felt God just pressing my heart was, Fred, where are you going to be in 10 years? You got 10 years ahead of you, a brand new decade, now, a new opportunity to step into this. What are you going to do with this? And when I say where are you going to be, I don't mean, I don't mean where you're going to go. I, I, I plan to be here unless you kick me out, but I plan on being here to bug you for the next 10 years. No, not bug you, but, you know, uh, I, I don't want to go anywhere in the next 10 years. It's where my heart is. But what am I going to do with those 10 years? How am I going to grow? How am I going to be a better person? How am I going to continue to learn, to, to grow more, to be more, to be more effective? I, I want to be. And I believe that we're called to be lifelong learners. And we don't, don't, you know, some people say, well, you know, this is how I am, and this is how I am, I'm going to stay this way. And yeah, you will. The problem is that you miss out on the opportunities of growth that God wants to do. And I strongly believe Anything that's not growing is dying. You're going in one direction or the other. You're not just existing. I believe if a marriage isn't growing, a marriage is drifting. You take look at nature. If a tree is not growing, it's dying. Because that's what it does. If a plant is not growing, it's dying. And so we need to grow. And, and so there's things that we do in our life to grow, to move forward and, and to move beyond that. So um, you know, one of the things that we, we've looked at is, is that challenge to to, to really, how do we develop that? And with this series, that was one of the intents is to really to create an awareness of the relationships that God wants to put in our lives. God uses people, works through people within our lives, develops relationships, and relationships challenge you. They stretch you. They inspire you. They, they build you. They keep you on track or they take you off track. They build you up or tear you down. They, they inspire you to do something or inspire you to do absolutely nothing, Right? And so when we look at it, it's, it's, it's the people that God puts in our life, the relationships we have, the communities that we have in our life that really help us along the way in the direction that we're going. You know, that advice that maybe your mom told you, I know I heard it numerous times in my life was, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, right? How many of you remember, ever heard that in your life before? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of you, we need to have a talk with your mama, okay? <laughs> Anyways, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But it really is so true. Show me your friends and I'll, I'll show you your future because you're, the people around you really help shape your future. When, when I look at myself as a pastor, it, me being a pastor was, was not saying that God didn't do it. He does, but he, God works. How many know that God works through people? Of course he works through his word, but he also reinforces it, inspires it, and puts people in our life that challenge us to move forward. And when I go back and I look at the people in my life, my dad my dad was a, was, a, was a great man, was a great pastor, and you know, I drew from that. But then there were other people that God put in my life that challenged me. Challenged me to stretch in this way, in that way, to, 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 to be better in certain other areas. I, and, how, and, and how I teach and how I do different things. I was inspired by different people, and it was like that connected. I was like, wow, that, I can connect with that. You know, I know in the beginning of, of pastoring, it was, it was hard because you know, I was 21 years old, and and, you, you, know, you know, you're kind of stepping out into a field that's totally new, and you know you're where God has called you, and you don't know what to do, and you're doing it, but you're like, uh, what am I doing here, you know? And, and so it, you, you kind of start saying, well, I'll, you know, you can, it's easy to mimic other people and say, well, I need to be like this one and be like that one. But the reality is that we need to be who God's called us to be and, and, and walk in that. But he'll use his people to help shape that. And he did. He used other, other pastors and other people to help challenge me that, that were seasoned leaders, people that were where I wanted to go. And through those relationships and through those friendships, it helped shape me. Amen? And so I look at that, and I really am a, a, you know, a part of my life, a big part of my life and who I am today is because of the, the examples and the people that God put in my life along this path and along this journey. And so are you. And so we look at that, that's vital, and that's why it's so important. And Solomon tells us this in Proverbs 13, 20. He says, walk with the wise, and you become wise. He says, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Wow, that's so true. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And so that's exactly what happens when we look at it. Who you walk with is vital. You know, you walk with people with a bad attitude, guess what? You start having a bad attitude. 
So I walk with people that, how many, how many know that when you hang out with complainers, it's easy to complain? I told you my story. I, I told it at first service. I, I've done it. I've been standing, not in a long time, but I've been standing in a, in a long checkout line at a grocery store. And, you, you know, what do you do? You just kind of stand in there. You know, you, you're surrounded by gum on one side and aliens being born on the planet, magazines on the other side, or whatever they have there, you know. All the gossip magazines on the other side. And, and so someone starts with a conversation, and you don't even know these people, and they're saying, oh, man, this line is so long, or, oh, the weather's horrible. And the next thing you know, like, yeah, I know, the weather just stinks. I can't believe it's so bad. Here tomorrow is supposed to be even worse. You know, before you know it, you're, like, complaining. And, and I remember catching myself one time. I was like, Fred, you don't even know this person. Why are you complaining? You, you know, I'm not a complainer. I really, I really am not a complainer. And I, I really don't like to be around people that complain. It's irritating to me. And, and so I, I really try to distance myself, you know, from being influenced by, by people that complain. And, um, but I, I, you get sucked right into it. And that's so true. When we, put, we surround ourselves with the wrong people, and, and listen, if you want to grow, if you want to grow in faith, you need to have someone that's speaking into your heart that's growing in faith also. Amen? You say, well, I want to get healthy. If you want to get healthy, the, you, you got to... You don't hang out with the couch potato. You hang out with the one that's like, woo, woo, all over the place, you know? I mean, you need to ask the guy, so how much Lycra do you own, okay? Maybe that's what you need to ask. Because, you know, if they own that much Lycra, they're probably working out all the time, okay? Stretchy anything, okay? But it's like, so you surround yourself with those things. And, you know, because when you surround yourself with people, and, and listen, one of the things I, I said in the beginning, week one, I'm not telling you to go to drop all your friends. I'm just saying it really comes to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the point of who we allow to speak into our life. The Bible says that we're called to be a light to the world. It says not to hide this light, not to put a basket in, or to hide the light of Christ in you, but to let it shine to the world around you. That we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that's understanding that we are in the world. So you know what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real big opponent of those Christians that feel, well, you know what? I'm, just, I'm a Christian. I don't want it to be contaminated by any non-believers. So you know what? I only have Christian friends. I eat Christian food. I, have, I wear Christian clothes and drive Christian cars. And you know, I only, Christ, everything's got to be Christian. I only listen to Christian this and Christian, Christian. And we talk scripture all day long and Christian, 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 Christian. And I just think that's going to mess you up mentally okay? Because we're not called to live in a bubble. We're called to live in this world. He says, you're in this world, but you're not of it. In other words, we have to be an influence to the world around us and understand that there are people who are going to speak into your life. That there needs to be a healthy balance. Listen, if I watch Christian television all day long, I'd be crazy. Because there's some crazy stuff on some of those channels. There's a lot of good stuff. But sometimes I look at it, and I'm just like, why did they let you on this channel? I'm sorry, I'm being probably too honest. Okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll pull back. So, Pastor, you can't say that. You're a pastor. You can't say that. But I'm like, they shouldn't be on here because they're a little woo out there. <laughs> Anyways, just leave that alone. <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that publicly that's being broadcast all over the place, but first service I can say those things. This one and the next one I can't really be as vocal sometimes as I'd like to be. But, but the reality is this, um, our friends, the people in our lives shape us and so it's, it's really what it is, is who do we give a voice into our heart? So you can have friends that may not be growing in faith or that your life needs to be an inspiration to them, but you need to have people in your life that will inspire you to grow in your faith. Amen? Because just as you're giving out, you've got to receive. As a pastor, that's why I'm, I'm so big. I, I go to a lot of different meetings and conferences and things like that. Why do I do that? You know, I, not because I always loved going somewhere. It's just because I'm giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out all the time. And if you're constantly giving out, you're going to wake up one day and you have nothing else to give out. you got to have something in to give out. And, I, you know, I, I do that to grow myself spiritually, getting in God's Word. And these 21 days of fasting and prayer that we're doing as a church are amazing. Those little tidbits and things that we get into our life, those nuggets we put in to help build and strengthen our life, challenge you to grow. Yes, if you haven't done that, you still get time. We're, we're almost done, but you can still jump on. You can get it all done, you know, just binge, binge pray, <laughs> binge read today uh, and tomorrow. But you can jump right in there still, or even do it after it's done. It's okay, because it's meant to grow you. Amen? It's meant to build you. And so, 
we, 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 who's speaking in our life. So today, though, I want to take it a little bit further. We, you know, that is, you know, we, we, is moving to that point of the, talking about the value of community in relationships. The communities that we're in. Community of faith. The, the church here, as a church, we're a community. And that community we're growing in, we're moving in. We, we see God working within that community because community is important. Now, some people struggle with that. I understand. I, I, I'm, I'm not the most, I mean, I'm a pastor and involved with a lot of different people, but outside of this, it, you know, I'm not always the most comfortable in a large setting with a lot of people, with people I don't know. And I'll kind of find myself gravitating to the most distant corner. I don't mean to. It's just that I, I, I get uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. I don't want to say something stupid. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know. So, so I kind of gravitate to just either someone I know and I'm like, like the, the leech hanging on to them the whole time, you know. And I remember Leslie used to always challenge me. He's like, Fred, would you not you get, you know, go talk to somebody you don't know? And I'm like, uh, I know. I know I'm not going to say something that looks stupid, you know. I don't say something dumb, you know. And so I've really worked to kind of move beyond that. But communities are important. We need communities. Because you build relationships in those. So community is important. And even if you struggle with it, it's understanding that we have to move beyond those boundaries to be able to reach out. And why? Because we're not created to be alone. Jesus said, looked at Adam, said, Adam, not good that you're alone. You need to be in a community. You need to be with others. And so there are three types of, Pastor Peter, last Sunday touched on, I think, just a little bit on this. And I'm going to pick up the, my part of it. And that was the three types of poverty. The three types of poverty that we look at. One is material poverty, poverty, which is pretty self-explanatory. We understand. In other words, it's having, you know, not enough money, but too much month. Was it too much month, but not enough money for the month, you know? Or, and, and so you, sometimes you find yourself in that place. How am I going to pay this bill? Do I don't have the money to do this right now? And, or, or maybe it's other extreme, you know, issues of poverty. But material poverty is understandable. We, we can, that's pretty self-explanatory. The other one is spiritual poverty, and that's really not knowing the life of God in your life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, or life lived in the overflow. Life that, that is above and beyond, and, and more in abundance within our life. And he says, so, so when we talk about having a relationship with, with, with God through Jesus, it's, it's just as it is. It's a relationship, not, not, not religion. It's not a ritual that we go through. Rituals never save anybody. Amen. They just become boring and numbing. Relationships are to be growing, vibrant, life. And that's what God wants to see in our lives when we come to know Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior. And that's what it is. It's a relationship. And that's what Jesus was talking about in that instance that, that we, we grow spiritually. We're not, we're not impoverished in our spiritual walk, but we're growing in that. And then there's the other part that you say, well, hey, I have a, I have a yeah, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a Christ follower. I've made Jesus Christ Lord of my life. Yes, I you know, I'm a Christian in, the, in this, the true sense of what that terminology means. And, but I still feel sometimes like I'm so in a desert spiritually. And can I just simply say, we've all been there. I've been there. There's times that you feel like you're just going through the motions. There's times that you go back and you say, you know, do I even really believe what I say that I believe? Can I dare to ask, is there anyone that's ever felt that way before? Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's a spiritual desert. So I've got to pick up, move forward. That's what this 21 days that we've been doing as a church is really good at moving that forward and challenging you to, to really move past that desert, that wilderness point in your life to really experience life and, and, and His presence within the midst of that. So don't get down because you feel like, even, even if you've been a believer for many, many years, you're like, I don't understand. Why do I feel this way? That's okay. We all have those moments. And that's where you keep pressing on. And then in the midst of those, you'll find that there are many times that God will even, in working through those things, he'll never leave you, never forsake you, but you, you hold on and you'll find out that there's so much that God is doing in your life as you've been going through those situations. Amen? Amen. The other one that I want to touch on today is the relational poverty. That's the relationships in our life. Um, what causes relational poverty? And so when we kind of look through this, and th- th- this, we're actually doing this in all, actually the, the whole church, when you talk about it as a, as a church in whole, our, our children's ministries are, are learning about the same thing we're talking about today. They're learning that downstairs. Our takeover student ministry, they're learning the same thing this week. They'll be having the same thing. Our circles are doing the same lesson this week. 
um, and uh, Celebrate Recovery uh, th- is also plugged in, and they've been talking about uh, friending also. So in all our platforms, we've really made it a point to touch all these things in there, to really talk about this because it's so vital, and, and the, the understanding of community. So as we do this, some of the things we've been using, some, some great things that Craig Rochelle and the church have done, we've connected together with this to really help really connect all of our platforms together, all the things that we're doing to help every area grow in the same idea. And so when we look at issues, okay, what causes relational poverty? Um, there are many different things. One of the things that they, they talk about is the fact is, is, is increased mo- uh, mobility. In other words, we just don't stay in the same place. When you think about a generation or two ago that when you got a job, you, the, the, the key was to get, a really, to get a job in a great place and, and then stay there and retire there, Right? If you, some of you think, some of you, your, your parents, your, your grandfather, your father, that that's the thing, got a job, oh yeah, I got this great job, I'm going to stay with him for the rest of my life. But then that kind of started switching a number of years ago, a little while back, and what it came is, is moved to more like, okay, I'm going to stay here for, you know, for a year or two, see how it is, if this doesn't work out, or if I can get a better job, then I'm going to switch to that. that see, if you tried that a generation ago or, or two ago, that would have been like death in, 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 your, in your career. Now it's called stepping to a better opportunity, a better job, better, better um, pay, all these different better benefits. And so now it's, it just, that it's kind of transitioned that. So where the, there were people that a generation or so ago that would be in a job that would know people and develop relationships for a lifetime because they've worked together. In fact, they've worked together and been together more than even with their own families because of the work. Where there was relationships that they were aware that nowadays you don't really have that. That's, a lot of that has really changed for the most part. And the other is the aspect of people that move. You know, we, they said that um, there's a, a statistic that was done by Moving Guides, the 2019 Moving Guides, Joshua Green. He said this, statistical data show that the average American moves once every five years. And they also say that the, the younger you are, the more, that you, the, the, the more that you move. Three to five, it's like three to four times or something of that sort. And I read that, I was like, wow, really? And then I started thinking, when Leslie and I, when we got married... Um, it was like, wow, we, yeah, we actually, within the first nine years, we moved two times, not including the, the move from our parents' house into a condo, and then from there into a house, and then again after that. So I guess, it, I guess, I mean, three times within, you know, 10 years or so, something of that sort. And you think, wow, that was a lot of bouncing around. And, you know, the rea- reality, the first the first place that we moved, the condo we moved in, we only really knew one, we were in a, you know, it's a two-story, so we, you know, there was like, in the, the, the building that we were in, there was four of us, and four families, and we had someone below us, and someone across from us, and, and you know, on the other side down, so, and I remember that, like, the first week we were there, then, you know, we would open our, our door to our condo that would go to the steps, and we kind of faced the other door to the other condominium, and we'd open it up, and and there was, I remember there was one time we go to open it up and kind of opened up the same time as the lady that lived across from us. And we opened up the door and she opened up the door and all of a sudden she slammed the door shut. And we were like, whoa, what happened with that? You know what, we lived there I think about four years. I have no idea what that lady even looked like. Never met her. I know what her door sounds like when it's shut every time she opened it. And there were times I would try and look at the little peephole and say, we're going to try to catch her, you know, to see who, who lives over. I don't know who this lady is. Like, she lived by herself, but I don't know if she didn't like us. I don't know what the case was, but there was something that she didn't want to know anything about us. And, you know, I'd look out there, try to, find, you know, see her, and, you know, and I'd hear her coming out, and I'd go to try to step out. She was fast. She was down, and we had a long stairs to go down. She was, boom, she was gone. And I was like, where does this lady go? She's got wings or something. So we never knew her in four years. If I passed her in the street today, I would have no idea who she was. And I think about that. Here we had four families, and we only knew one family. The only reason we knew that one family is because we had a dog, and they had a dog. Moved to the next place. That house there, we knew the family that was right next to us, an elderly couple that, that was, he, the guy was very handy with things, and he would help me with stuff that I didn't know, and I would help him with other stuff too. And, and then we had other, you know, families around us. So we're, now we're in a neighborhood, and we never really got to know anybody except this one, one family, the couple here. And, and I remember I had the opportunity to meet one of the neighbors that lived kind of diagonally across the street. And, and she goes, oh, okay. so and this was like three years after living there for like three years. She says to us, she goes, oh, it's so nice to meet you. She goes, first time I'm actually seeing him. I'm like, what are you talking about? She, I think she was like the watch. You know, there's always one person on the neighborhood that watches everything you do. I think they have like secret, secret mics in your house and like, you know, 
no, no, those things, whatever those things, binoculars, I don't know, anyways. But she watched, she knew us, she goes, she goes, yeah, you know, she goes, oh, it's so nice to be, you know what we call you? We call you the ghost family. I'm like, who's we? <laughs> Who are all the we that are in on this? And, and she goes, I said, oh, really? She goes, yeah, we, we see the car come in, but, but we never see you get out. We see lights on the house, but we never see people. We never see anybody. And she goes, so we just call you the ghost family because lights are on and the car's there and the car's gone, but we don't see people. I'm like, wow, you need to get a life, lady. That's what I wanted to say, but I, I didn't say that. But, but then I thought about it. I said, that's pretty bad. That's, that's really bad. I should know these people to some degree. At least you know that I'm not a ghost and that I actually do exist. But see, that, the, mo- the momentum, the movement that we do many times, and because of life changes, we, don't, we have a deficiency in our relationships. The other, one of the other things that takes place is, is simple things like, you know, I remember growing up as a kid, younger, then visiting our family in South Carolina, that there was, it was very common to, to have on a front porch, have many people sit outside, you know, at night, eat dinner, and then go outside, and neighbors walk by, hey, how you doing? You see people walking by, you talk to your neighbors, and that whole kind of, you know, um, that whole time of environment. I know when we were, uh, Pastor Peter and I were in Cuba, uh, this is a number of years ago, and the one house that we were, we were staying with, and they had, and they had a front porch, and that was like, we went out there, and we sit on the front, there's a little, the little stoop on the front of the house, and, and the road is right there. People walking by, they're talking to us and, and saying hi in Spanish and vice versa. And, and, you know, you see people go by, and everybody's waving. It was just, it was like, wow, it was so cool. Kind of brought back a lot of memories from when I was a young kid. And then uh, one of the statistics that we, we looked up and we saw and we read that, that, that stated was the fact that why some of that change takes place is, is because of air conditioning. And I was like, air conditioning? When I heard it, I was like, okay. Then I started thinking about it. That's right. You know, you cook dinner. The stove was hot. The house is hot. It's cooler outside than inside if you don't have air conditioning. And so you go out there, hang out. You get to meet people and stuff like that. So in other words, the, the modern conveniences in our life change. iPads, tablets, and things like that. People, you know, you go to restaurants. Everybody's focused in those things. And phone, all these different things. And, and as good as those things may be, it changes us. Attached garages. I mean, I, we have an old house that was built in the 20s, and so we have a detached garage, but all the new houses and condominiums and apartment complexes and different buildings, they have, you, you hit a button, you drive in underground or into your parking spot, and you go in there and you get on the elevator, you go up the stairs, you walk into your house, whatever it may be. You don't have to, you can live there for 20 years and never even see what your neighbor looks like if you don't want to. You can totally detach yourself from anybody around you because you just drive in, shut the door, and you're, you're there. And so there's that, that deficiency of, of really knowing people around our life. And, and the other one we talked about two weeks ago was the, the social media. And listen, I'm not, a, I'm not coming against the social media. I'm fine with social media. But we said as long as we have a healthy perspective of the fact that it's, it's, some, it's a tool, but it's not, should not be, it's not a relational. You're not making friends. Listen, you can have 100 to, to 1,000 friends on any social media platform and not have anybody to talk to. And so it really becomes a point of deferred loneliness within our life. It's something that is missing. Someone's missing. Some group is missing in our lives that we need to be, we need to be proactive about putting in there. So this is the point that we want to make this, is that you are one community away from changing the course of your destiny. One community away. In other words, we need community. There's something about a group of people, friendships that God puts into our life, whether it's a group of, of families that you, that you grew up with, that you're all friends, that you, that you come together with, or whether it's a community in a church such as this, or a group within the church that you become, or like our circles groups or things like that, that you become connected with. Those families and those groups and those friends shape your life, that you do life together with, that they, you know, maybe some of you have been fortunate enough to have friends, a groups of friends that have been with you all through your life. A lot don't, some do. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And so anyways, the, the fact that the value of community within our life and, and how that comes into our place. In fact, this, the scripture talks about this, Acts chapter 2. Now you have to kind of think about, in, in the New Testament, this is, this is Acts is, is then now after Jesus has, has died, rose again, ascended into heaven, the apostles are now going out, they're preaching, they're teaching, they're, people are coming to Christ, churches are being established, and a lot, most of them are home churches, they didn't have, couldn't use a building like this, so they were in a home, and it, you know, it wasn't because it was like the biblical thing to do, it was the only way they could do it. A lot of them were under intense persecution, to be arrested, killed, or made sport of, and all different things, so they were under a lot of pressure in, in many of the cities that, that the gospel was going into. 
And so in Acts chapter 2, it talks about this. In verse 42, verse 46, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In other words, community focused in a Christ-centered environment. He goes on to say, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were, what were they? Together. Not alone. There was a togetherness. They were all together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another who had need. You, you have to think about this in, in this situation. Here they, they, were, they were in such a community because they're, they're all together around a community of faith in, in Christ, but also a community that's, that's being persecuted. That in some of the cities being hunted down, and some of the cities being put to death. And yet in this community, they were thriving. And so if they had somebody in their community or in their, in their group that, that maybe had lost all their property because they were a believer, and there's, there's countries today that that's the case. If you're a Christ follower, and they can literally come in and take everything that you have away from you because you're not doing If you convert, in fact, there's, there's a number of things. If you convert from this religion to Christianity, then you could either lose your life, that's the death sentence is for one of them, and there's others that they can come in and take everything that you own because it's illegal for you to convert from this faith to this faith. And so they were dealing with the same exact things back then. And so what would happen was if they lost all their property, had no food, no no nothing, they, they had what it simply said is they came together, they literally even to the point of selling their property, selling, they're taking their possessions and giving it to anyone who was in need. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned, I don't know if I did in every service, but the Christian community, the body of believers, you know, would literally take and in, in gather up children that had been discarded. One of the things in Roman, I believe it was also Greek culture also of that time, but if any children were born with any defects, any disabilities, and any capacity whatsoever, they would throw them away. They, they were considered cursed. They were considered sinful or whatever, and they would throw them away. They would either give them as an offering and burn them. They'd throw them into trash heaps. They would put them on upon the, wall, the city walls so that animals and vultures would take them. See, that, it's like because if you were, had any imperfection whatsoever, they would just cast you out. And so here what happened, and there's historic, historical documents of what would happen, the Christians would go out at night when no one see them, and they'd get these kids, and they'd bring them in and adopt them into their own family and take care of them. Society had discarded them that they would gather them because they were a community that was driven by a love and an affection and an appreciation for life. Because they had received life in Christ, they were giving life to others. That's what a community strives and challenges within our life. A community that moves forward and says, you know what, we can do all things through Christ Jesus. He's taking care of us, he provides us, he's going to see us through in all this. And see, that community did not happen by accident, but it was intentional and it was Christ-focused. And that's when I look at the fact that was this, this past week I was reading up some of the, the, the comments that we've got back and that people had, had, had posted about their involvement in some of the circles groups that we had, they, which are starting up um, next month, I believe. And so, actually today, today's registration. So get on there today. Get in a circle if you're not in one because they're life-changing. And some of the comments, like, it was, I, I sat there and I was just like, I was so overwhelmed by some of the things I was reading because it was exactly what we had been praying for that we wanted to see happen, is people growing and doing life together. Statements like, we become friends for life. This is my family. I'm, I'm bonding with people I probably never would have had the opportunity to bond with before. I'm getting to know others from church intimately instead of just a high or a buy. I, I've discovered that there are people just like me. See, sometimes we, when we're going through situations, we think we're the only person that's dealing with this. When you come into community, you find out you're not the only one. You know what, that, that, that God, that we're, we're all, we all deal with issues. In fact, speaking of that, let's just jump into this. Communities, what are the three qualities of communities? Number one is this, we are family. It's understanding the fact that we are family. That, that, that's huge. When we understand that we are family, that the Bible talks about and calls us that being brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the body of Christ. That makes us family. You know, what I found is that no matter where you go on, the, on this planet and you run into someone that is a, a Christian, that's a believer, man, your life just opens up. Man, you're like instantly, you just know, this is, this is, this is family. I, we may not even speak the same language. We may have to use hand signals and point to things and whatever, but the fact is there's a bond. And I've, ha- I've, I've had that same experience, and it's like, wow, these are family. You know, I remember being in, a, in we were one place, and 
uh, I was one time, and it was, it was a really challenging place. It was one of those ones that I wasn't feeling very safe in, and, and, and uh, it was another country, and uh, different language and all these other things, and then it was just a little, it was like, you, sometimes I've been in some of these areas, and it's just like, uh, just, you know, I'm standing out really big here and not feeling very comfortable, you know, and it wasn't really a safe place, and moved into, then found the people that I was supposed to connect with, and the church people, and all that, and it was amazing, all of a sudden, we're not even speaking the same language, but I felt fine, it was like, any fear, any apprehension, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, because of why I'm with family now, I don't even know these people by name, but we're family. Amen? I, see, I have, why is that important? Because we need to understand and see the fact that there's something about family. Um, how, think about this. How would you react if one day you get a knock on the door, you open it up, and maybe it's a neighbor that you don't even know, walks right past you into your kitchen, opens up your refrigerator, starts making themselves a sandwich, grabs a bottle of water or a Coke or something, walks past, hey, thanks, bro, appreciate it, and walks out the door. What would you do? You're like, you better be back here. Give me back my drink, give me back my sandwich, and get out of my house, and don't come back in again. Don't be plundering through my refrigerator, right? Think about this. People could be standing in your kitchen, but, and if you don't know them, but if they walk over to your refrigerator, open up, you're going to be like, what are you doing? You may not say it, but you're thinking, are they seriously opening up my refrigerator? They don't have refrigerator rights. You're not opening up the refrigerator. Okay. But if your family comes in, right, if your family comes in or, or a close friend and they walk up and they open up your refrigerator and you're, you're cool with this, it's no big deal. Oh, help yourself. When, when I've had friends of ours that have stayed with us, I, I'll tell them, look, here's all the stuff. Here's the refrigerator. Here's the, the, the plates are here. The forks are here. The bowls are here. The pantry's over here. Just help yourself. Whatever you want, anytime. If you're hungry in the middle of the night, get up, eat it, help yourself. Just dig, keep plundering. Like I just dig through, you'll find something. When I go to their house, the same as that way. They're like, Fred, just go in there. You know where every, you know, they're like, you know where everything is. Just help yourself whenever. Do you, anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, there is such a thing called refrigerator rights. There honestly really is. Now, it, and it's a big deal because it, it, what it does, it really shows the connection of the relationship. Because a person that you don't know does not have the right to walk in and open your refrigerator. But as someone that you, and as the Urban Dictionary, I don't, I don't buy with everything Urban Dictionary says, but they actually got it right on this. They said this, Urban Dictionary defined refrigerator rights as depth, the depth and closeness and intimacy of a relationship. Refrigerator right, rights means that we have a depth, we have a closeness, and we have an intimacy that if you can come in and open up my refrigerator at any time and plunder through it all you want and eat whatever you want out of it. Not everybody has the right to do that. Now, why is that important? When we're talking about coming together, we read a scripture, Acts 2, 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. There was a closeness. They had refrigerator rights. They were family. They were able to come together. So my question is this, when we're talking about the relationships in our life, we're talking about an impoverished relationship society, my question is this, how many people outside of your family have refrigerator rights in your life? Listen, and I, I'm kind of particular with who goes in my refrigerator, to be quite honest with you. And when I walk in someone's house, even if they tell me, it's going to take me a while before I open up their refrigerator. But once I do, and once you break that barrier, it's okay. I mean, I have very good friends of mine that try to visit at least once, or once a year at least. And, you know, I, they don't even have to tell me. They're like, they're like Fred, we know, you like, we know you like blueberries and all kind of berries. So we, we bought some berries in the refrigerator. Just help yourself. And you know what? I do. I don't ask. I just go in there, open it up, dig through, and they do the same thing in my house. They totally have all the rights to everything in my house. There's nothing in my house. And they, they've seen my junk rooms. We all have them. They've seen my junk drawer. I'm like, eh, I don't care. You've seen it. I don't care. See, that speaks of the depth of the relationship. Not everybody has that. Most people come into my house, that door is going to be locked. I don't have a lock, but it's going to be locked. I'm going to put the pit bull in there, and it's going to be, you're not going in that room, okay? Well, she would just look you to death. That would be about it. So, anyways, that's important. How many people outside your family have refrigerator rights in your life? And how many people outside your family do you have your refrigerator rights right in your life? 
And the answer to that question tells us how impoverished or how fruitful we are in our relationships. God created us to depend on him and to depend on each other. It's not easy. It's a little risky. But we were not created to do life alone. We were created to share it with one another and share it with one another in community. The second thing is this. I've got to move these quickly. second one is this. We're all flawed. We're not just family, but we're flawed. In other words, there's no perfect people. You know what? Can I tell you something? Can I tell you a secret? Oasis Christian Center is not a perfect church. Thank God it's not. But you know what? The reality, if, you can't, if you're here today expecting a perfect church, guess what? You, you're gonna, something's going to disappoint you. Somebody is not going to live up to your expectations. I will fail you and not live up to your expectations on something. I may not remember your name. You know, it's like it, it, we're flawed. You know, I, I had a, I'm trying to think, I shared this in the first service. You know, um, I, there's times that I, my neighbors, I know them, total blank. This happened yesterday. And I'm sitting there, I cannot remember my neighbor's name. Three, like, they've been living next to me for like three years. And I walk outside, and I'm shoveling the snow. I had to go to the grocery store, pick up some stuff, and I'm thinking, I don't remember this. I know him. I know his wife's name. I know his, I know his kid's name. Cannot remember his name. I'm running names through my head. Like, what is his name? And listen, I'm not losing it. It's just I just don't remember his name. I get in the car, drive to the grocery store. I stop. I text my daughter. What is our neighbor's name? <laughs> She's texting me. She goes, I don't know. I don't remember. She's texting me names. I'm like, nope, not that name, not that name. Because I'm thinking he's going to be back outside still shoveling, possibly. I, if I run into him, I need to at least be like, instead of, hey, I need to like say, hey, so-and-so, or, you know. I'm out there, I'm thinking, Okay, I'm waiting for him to acknowledge me because I can't acknowledge him because I can't remember his name. And it's, just like, and we're, it's not like we're, we live like house, house, driveway, house, driveway, house, driveway. So, so there, it's not like he's way over yonder. He's like, like, I'm here and he's there. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? Don't know your name right now. That's pretty bad. I, I'm, that's, I don't even know why I'm telling you guys that, but I did. <laughs> About 11.30 last night, over five hours later, I'm like, oh, yes, that's his name. I remember his name. I guess that's why, you know, some more traditional churches always use the brother-sister thing. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. <laughs> don't know your name, but you're a guy, so you're a brother. Hey, sister. Yeah, I don't know you either, but hey, we're family. All right? It works. <laughs> Trust me, it works. <laughs> I forget my own kid's name sometimes. They're like, I call them the dog. Not dad, we're not the dog. Okay, we're, you know. Like... Some of you are really worried right now, aren't you? So, anyways, some, some of you are happy because you're like, hey, he's just like me. Others are like, man, this guy is like losing it. What's going on with him? Another word, but anyways, we, we forget many times when it comes to other people. We, we hold people to unrealistic expectations that we don't even measure ourselves up to. I can't believe they did that. Well, have you ever done that? Yeah, but they shouldn't do that. So you have an un unattainable expectation for them to have to reach, but you won't hold yourself by the same expectation. That's wrong. That's not right. We're all flawed. We're going to miss it. And flaw is not an excuse to stay that way. It's just an understanding that we don't have it all together and we're growing. We judge, but we get mad if we are judged by somebody else. We expect others to forgive us, but we don't forgive them. We don't stop to see the issue through their eyes and through their situation, but we expect them to see our situation and our problems and understand them through our eyes. And say, well, they should understand me, but I don't have to understand them. See, we must remember that we're all flawed. Not all perfect. When I see us as family, when I see us as flawed, I can look past the little ridiculous things that sometimes we do and the little failures that we have. But when I live in a way that, well, this is this, and they should be like this, and they should be like that. No, 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 we, we're flawed. Everybody has a bad day. Even I have a bad day. I may smile a lot here, but there's sometimes, like, I've had a really bad day and didn't act so nice sometimes. Are you with me? I'm being honest. Be honest back, amen? We all had those days. We're just ornery, miserable, right? Maybe he didn't smile at somebody, you know, just growled at them. Maybe he didn't hold the door. Let it kind of just slam it. Whoever was behind, I didn't do that, but I'm just saying, you know, whatever. And we get all bent out of shape. Well, I'm never going to talk to that. I'm going, have you ever had a bad day before? Can we allow ourselves to have flaws and move beyond that? As a church, we have to be able to understand that 
Well, everybody's in church, church. They should all be good. They, are you kidding me? It's not a perfect church because there's no perfect people in the church, so there's never going to be perfect. So I've got to overlook your flaws. You need to overlook my flaws, and we need to understand as a family, as a community, for us to move forward, we have to understand that. And if we don't understand that, then we're going to be looking at people with, with eyes that are ridiculous, with expectations that we should not. Well, they should have been like this. Hey, they're human. They have bad days. They get upset. They get depressed. They, they make mistakes. They forget things. It happens. We all do that. Amen? Shouldn't. We all do it. It's bound to happen. And so we have to understand that we have to show grace to other people. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another. Then just as Christ accepted you, he accepted me with all my, fault, my faults and flaws and all the things. Then he says, you know what? Then you need to accept others with their faults and flaws and all the things they have too. In order to bring praise to God, we have to do that. Amen? God gives grace to us. In turn, we show grace to others. There's an amazing story, and I know I'm out of time, but there's an amazing story that is in the Old Testament. This, and I'll give you the last point, and we'll be out of here. And every time I read this story, I'm, I'm going to teach on it coming up soon. I don't know when, but I just, it's in me, and I want to teach on it. And, but it's the story of, of King David. David, the Goliath killer, becomes king of Israel. And in the battle that he, that, that there's a, and so his, his, the king, King Saul, who was the king before him, who was trying to kill David, and his son Jonathan, who David was, was really good friends with, they get killed in a battle. Now, the common thing back then was the fact that, that a new king coming in to, to secure the throne would kill all the descendants of the previous king's, you know, uh, lineage. That was a common thing. So when King Saul dies, and Jonathan dies, who would be the next one in line on the throne, the nurse that took care of Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, grabs him in the hurry to get out, to flee, because he doesn't know, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know who's going to, whoever's going to come in and take over as the king is going to kill this child, this baby, this, this young child. So she grabs the child, grabs him, and goes to run out, and as she does, whatever happens, she, she drops him. And when she drops him, he, he is injured, and he's no longer able to walk after that. He goes into hiding, and he's living way off far, and you know, being in a, with a disability such as that during that time of society, you were looked down on, and it, it, you know, it was, it was really bad. It was a bad scenario. I mean, it can be tough now with people with disabilities, and we live in one of the best, most accessible times, but it's still not where it needs to be. Amen? And I'm a huge advocate for that. So every time I look at this, this story, and I just think this, 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 this guy, this young kid growing up with, you know, that, that was the grandson of the king that should have had all this stuff, and now he's, his, his leg's been broken. He's unable to walk. He's dependent on someone to help him in all, everything that he does. And he's in hiding because he doesn't know if King David is going to kill him if he finds out he's alive. And one day, God puts on David's heart to ask the question, are there any descendants of Saul that are still living of King Saul? And most kings would ask that question, just like King Herod, we just had Christmas, he asked the question about, about Jesus, and he goes in and to try to find Jesus and kill him. He kills all the young boys under two or two and under and kills the entire, the entire region. Every baby, under boy, under two, kills them to try to wipe out the threat of Jesus being, and he didn't understand him being the king of kings, what was going to happen. But, and so, Mephibosheth, yeah, you know, the guy, Meth. <laughs> he, he's probably afraid when he finds out that the king is calling him. And he comes before the king and he makes this statement that, man, it just, every time I read it, it's just like inside of me, just to connect with this young kid, this young guy, what he must have been feeling. First of all, he doesn't know if he's going to live, but he comes in and he, bow, he gets down, he bows down. Remember, he can't walk, so he's probably already crawling. And he lays and prostrates his body before the king to, to honor him. And he says, why do you want anything to do with this dead dog? He refers to himself, he sees himself as a dead dog with nothing of value, nothing of worth. And David looks at him and he says, in his flaws, society had rejected him. And he looks at him in his flaws and he says to him, and, and this is my word, but basically he's like, Are you, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, no, no, you're not flawed. He goes, I wanna give you I want to give you all the benefits of your grandfather, his lands, his wealth, everything. It's yours. I want to give it to you. I, want to re I don't want to kill you. 
I want to bless you with everything that's rightfully yours. He says, you know what I also want you to do? He goes, I don't want you crawling around here. I don't want you to feel like a dead dog. He goes, from now on, when you eat dinner, you're not going to be eating way out in the place where you were. You're going to be sitting next to me at my table. So from now on, every single time you eat, you're going to be sitting at the king's table. And everybody in, this, everybody in the kingdom would love to give anything to sit at the king's table to eat with the king. Because nobody did that unless it was by invitation of the king. And David says, Mephibosheth, you're sitting with me. You will eat. In fact, Scripture says that in 2 Samuel 9, 7, uh, 13. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. I love the fact that Samuel includes that part about that, not as a derogatory thing, but for you and I, that even though we're flawed, God still sees us as valuable. Your flaws... Your disabilities, and emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever they may be, whatever challenge you're dealing with, that God says, you know what? It, says, it doesn't make any difference because when I look at you, I don't see any of that, and I, I want you to sit. You're sitting at my table because that's who you are. You are a chosen generation. You're a, ro- a royal priesthood. You're a son and daughter of God. This is where you sit because of who you are, because of who I am in your life. Amen? We're flawed, but we're blessed. We're flawed, but we're accepted. We're flawed, but empowered because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. And the last thing is this, number three, we fight lions. And I don't really have time to get into all this, but 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have to understand that we all have an enemy. Satan would love to take you out, would love to isolate you, would love to make you feel like no one cares, you're by yourself, there's no way that you could get back, you're a loser, blah, 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 blah. But God says this, that we are a family, and we all have a common enemy, that we must stand together and support one another. So what does that mean? That means as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must stand together. Don't fight cancer alone. Don't fight failure alone. Don't fight an addiction alone. Don't be swept away by hurt and shame and, and pride and pride that holds you back from asking and connecting with a community to grow and get out of it. But step into the body of Christ to love you, to embrace you, to support you, and fight with you. You're not. If, see, listen, if you're alone, you're vulnerable. But we are called to be together. John 13, 35 says that everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That's what we're known by, and that's what we should be known by. A community, a community that comes together, that changes the course of our destiny, and that changes the course of our direction of where we're going as we go out serving God and walking within that. Amen? Let's be a community that is strengthened. We're family, we're flawed, and we have a common enemy that we are standing against. So let's not do this bickering junk that sometimes happens in the body of Christ and churches around the world. Amen? But began to see it in a different day. We're all on the same team. Amen? We're still working. We are community. We are family. We have flaws, but God loves us, and we accept each other, and we move forward in that, and we are powerful together, in, indestructible together. Amen? Can do great things and bless great communities and help many people and make, a, make changes in our communities and our cities together. Amen? So let's do it together. Would you stand? Let me pray for you guys.